Welcome back to Civil Wars. I'm William Spaniel, and this lecture is on mechanism design. To recap where we were last time, we are now interested in figuring out how to manipulate conflict. Now, that being said, we are very limited in the types of negotiations that we've analyzed so far. In fact, we've only analyzed one type or one structure of negotiations, the ultimatum game. That's where the government made an offer to the rebel group, which the rebel group accepted or rejected, accepting leading to peace and rejecting leading to war. That's the only option that each actor faced. It was an offer and an accept-reject choice. That's it. So if we're thinking about different ways we could incentivize peace, perhaps the clearest, uh, best place to start this process would be with the actual way the parties negotiate with one another. So we might not just be limited to ultimatum games. What happens if we have a different sort of negotiation? Will we see peace outcomes improve? Will we see fewer peace outcomes? What's going to happen when we restructure negotiations between parties? Now, this is important because if we think about the outcomes that we observe in the world, those outcomes are a function of strategic play. So something's going on in the world. An actor or a government is behaving strategically. It's trying to do the best it can, given that a rebel group is also behaving strategically and trying to do the best it can as well. This is a little bit of a mess, but when they are in these sorts of situations, they're behaving strategically, and those strategic choices that the actors make give us outcomes. But strategic play is itself a function of the game being played. And so if we're only analyzing an ultimatum game, we might wonder, well, what would happen if we had a different sort of negotiations? How would strategic play change? And if strategic play is going to change, then that may very well result in the change in an outcome. We might see peace where we had war previously, or we might see war where we had peace previously. Now, the study of figuring out how to properly design an institution to get what you want it to do is called mechanism design. But there's a big challenge here in trying to figure out what the best mechanism or institution or way of having a rebel group and a government negotiate with each other is. That is, we need to study all the different types of negotiation games that a combatant could play or that combatants could play. If we're trying to figure out what is best for society as a whole, that means we have to cover every single different type of negotiation game out there. And there are two clear challenges here. One, there are infinitely many of such negotiation games. And two, we know that strategic play is itself a function of the game being played. And so we can't just create an institution or a way of negotiating and immediately understand how players are going to behave in that, the players are going to act strategically. And so that's going to be a bit of a challenge. Mechanism design, fortunately, allows us to figure out both of these things. But just to be a little bit more clear about what these challenges are, we have all sorts of different mechanisms to consider. Again, mechanisms meaning in an institution, a bargaining institution, a way to have a rebel group and a government negotiate with each other. We've seen one such mechanism, the ultimatum game, but we might think of other ways that a rebel group and a government could bargain with one another. Maybe instead of just playing an ultimatum game, you play an ultimatum game, and then if the receiver of the offer doesn't like it, uh, the rebel group in this case could make a counter offer to the government. Or maybe it doesn't just end there. Maybe there are two counter offers where the government can make a counter offer if it doesn't like the rebel group's counter offer. And maybe we just have more and more of these counter offers. Maybe there are also different ways they can talk to each other. So rather than just immediately having the government make an offer to the rebel group, maybe the rebel group sends a message to the government about how resolved it is or how powerful it believes it is, and then we play an ultimatum game. Or maybe we have multiple rounds of negotiations and messages being sent all throughout. There are a whole bunch of different ways of doing business here, and each of these different ways of doing business might actually result in a different outcome of the game. Furthermore, because players have this incentive to behave strategically, we can't just change the form of negotiations and immediately understand what's going to happen here. You can't induce people to do things simply by telling them to do it. Rather, you need to create an incentive structure that does not encourage gaming of the system. And to see what I mean, to see what a good institution is versus a bad institution, let's talk about a particularly bad institution that you might have already heard about. Going back to the 2012 Olympic Games, there was this badminton scandal in the women's doubles tournament. 
Now, the way the women's doubles tournament was structured was four groups with four teams each. And within your group, you play round robin. So there are three other teams in your group. You play one game each or one match each with each of those other groups. And then after you've done all of that, the top two finishers from each group advance to a single elimination bracket. So the top two teams advance from each group, so there's eight teams, and they go to the quarterfinals. Well, something weird happened on the last day of round-robin play. China had the top two teams in the world heading into the Olympics and through the Olympics too. Everyone agreed that China's two teams were the best teams in the world. And on the final day of round robin play, the team from Denmark upset the Chinese number two seed. Now this wasn't super disastrous for the Chinese number two seed. They had won their previous two matches, so they were going on to the semifinals or rather the quarterfinals anyway. But because Denmark won, Denmark became the top seed out of that round robin group. And so this created strange incentive structures for the quarterfinals bracket. And in fact, later on in that day, the Chinese number one seed played against South Korea. And if we had various winners and losers in that match, we would see them advance to the quarterfinals in the following way. The winner would move up to the top of the bracket, and the loser would go to the bottom half of the bracket of these quarterfinals. Now, the winner of this game in the semifinals would conceivably play the Chinese number two seed, the second best team in the world. In contrast, the loser of this game, which would still be guaranteed to advance to the quarterfinals, win or lose, both of these teams advance to the quarterfinals. Well, this loser would, in the semifinals, either play the Japanese number four seed or that Denmark team that had gotten really lucky in defeating the Chinese number two seed earlier on. So think about this for a moment. If you're a team that's trying to win a gold medal at this tournament, are you better off winning this game or losing this game? Well, if you want to get through the semifinals, your best bet is to lose this game. That way, at worst, you'll be facing the Japanese number four seed in the semifinals rather than the second best team in the world. So actually, both the Chinese team and South Korean team realized that their incentives for this match were not to win, but to lose. Losing would ultimately be better for these teams over the course of the tournament if they wanted to win a gold medal. And so if you actually watch this match, the Chinese team and the South Korean team tank it in increasingly humorous ways, ranging from intentionally hitting serves into the net, letting it drop when it was very clearly going in and not going out, and at various points feigning injuries, which kind of looked pathetic, but at the same time was pretty funny. Well, they both tank this, but China tanks better, and so South Korea quote-unquote wins and gets the less desirable draw in the quarterfinals, and the Chinese number one seed actually gets the better draw in the quarterfinals by losing. Now, this erupted into a scandal. Bureaucrats, because bureaucrats don't really have anything else to do, got really upset with what was going on. And so both teams were disqualified ultimately for, quote, not using their best efforts, end quote, and, quote, conducting oneself in a manner that is clearly abusive or detrimental, detrimental to the sport, end quote. Now, that being said, what was really going on here? Well, I submit that we shouldn't be hating the player, we should be hating the game. If bureaucrats really wanted these players to play to win, they should have designed an institution that incentivized players to win. The tournament structure, in fact, did not do that. In this last round of round-robin play, or this last match of round-robin play, those teams, the Chinese number one seed and the South Korean seed, or the South Korean team, had no incentive to win. They had all the incentive to lose. And so really, what's going on here is not the failure of the players so much as the failure of the institution to properly incentivize what we would want an institution to incentivize. We would want an institution to incentivize players to play to win, and the institution did no such thing here in this case. And furthermore, if we go back to what the players were disqualified for, not using their best efforts and conducting oneself in a manner that is clearly abusive or detrimental to the sport, well, the players were put in a no-win situation here. They did not have incentive to win if they wanted to win a gold medal. And that's putting the players in really a, a no-win situation, so to speak. They're supposed to win this game and simultaneously supposed to lose this game. So it's really hard to blame the players for doing what they did. And in fact, if we think about this even further, I would also submit that the bureaucrats should get 
their fingers pointed at, or we should be pointing our fingers rather at the bureaucrats because the bureaucrats were not using their best efforts for creating a mechanism that actually incentivizes the players to behave properly and thereby leading those players to have a situation where they're clearly being abusive and conducting things that are detrimental to the sport. So it was actually the institution that's detrimental to the sport, which caused the players to do things that was detrimental to the sport. So all this is trying to, to explain and to show you is that we can't just tell governments and rebel groups to get along like we can't just tell badminton doubles teams to try to play to win. We actually need to put an incentive structure in front of them to convince them to do that. And so that's what we're going to be looking at this unit. Can we create incentive structures that actually convince players, governments, and rebel groups to reach peaceful settlements rather than go to war? Under what conditions is this possible? Or perhaps it is impossible. Well, we'll be able to figure that out using mechanism design. So I hope you enjoyed this and hope to see you next time when we dig deeper into this problem. Take care.